little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Ain't gonna let Satan blow it out I'm gonna let it shine Ain't gonna let Satan blow it out I'm gonna let it shine Ain't gonna let Satan blow it out I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine till Jesus comes, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word. Just to rest upon His promise, just to know the safe Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge me Neat the healing, cleansing flood Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I've proved Him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him more Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus, simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me to the Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Good morning, everybody, and what a pleasure and what a joy it is to walk in the grace of and the trust that we have in Jesus Christ and to know that no matter what we face, no matter what happens, that Jesus is with us in all of his grace, all of his glory, and all of his power. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this day for that grace that we find in the salvation that you've provided for us in Jesus Christ. Lord, we stand before you this morning completely undeserving of anything that you've done for us, but, Father, completely thankful for all that you did for us. God, you're such a great God, 
Such an awesome God. And Lord, today we just want to say thank you. And today we just want to worship you with a few songs. And Father, the preaching and hearing of your precious word. Lord, be with us by your Holy Spirit. Guide us in everything we do. And we'll give you the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a couple of things real quick like uh, I put out the new uh, calendar from May uh, just a few minutes ago, so you may not have seen it yet, but it is up on the uh, church's Facebook page right now, so if you want to go over there and print it out or, or check it out, uh, do so. It's there. Not much different. Uh, I don't see much change coming up. I know some churches are intending to uh, begin to meet again at the end of the month with some restrictions and variations. And uh, I've talked to uh, our deacons, to our, our, our church elders and leaders, and for right now, we're, we're just going to stay in a hold pattern, okay? Um, I, I, right now, there's just we just don't know right now. Uh, the only thing that that will affect is May does have five Sundays, uh, and so it would have been a the community fellowship at the end of the month. And as of right now, I don't see that happening. So just uh, just know that. Also, on a different note, do know that next Sunday is Mother's Day. And even though we won't be meeting together, we will be meeting by the, the miracle and the grace of technology. Uh, just remember that. And mothers, uh, just a little early Mother's Day thing. We love you and we appreciate everything that you've done. And uh, I was just thinking about my mother last night and this morning while I was uh, preparing a message and thinking forward about things to do. And I'm just, I just praise God I have the mother that I do and uh, the faith and the, 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 the upbringing that she instilled in me and my brother. And uh, uh, daddy had a lot to do with it too, with the faith that we share and, and the life that we live in Jesus Christ. But it's Mother's Day and, and I just want to thank mama because a lot of what you see today in me, and I hope it's all good, comes from mom and daddy and from the, the way they raised us and the things that they taught us and instilled in us. And so a lot of what you see when you see me preach, when you see me sing, whatever it is that you see me do, it comes from what my mother and my daddy put in me. And so, Mama, just, just a week early, and I'll tell you again next week, Happy Mother's Day, and I love you very much. Also, on the prayer list, there was one or two additions. Uh, first of all, we want to thank God for Rick Fuller. Thing went good with him, and we praise God for that, and we praise God that, and we ask God that you would just continue to touch, touch Rick and strengthen him and, and give him health. And Lily uh, Zolaki, we just uh, pray that, that things will continue to go well with her but you'll notice also there was an addition the knox family and uh, uh even though I, I don't know or no in the church we don't know the knox family personally they it's some friends of my mother's and matter of fact it's jack my stepdaddy it's his sister it's some friends of theirs he was a police officer in houston and he was killed in a helicopter crash that's what he did he flew the police helicopters and he was killed in a helicopter crash and he had a, a young family so if you would remember the Knox family let me also remind you that if you have a need during this time if, if you're not working uh, what, whatever if you have a need during this time or you know somebody that does some friends or some family that does please let us know because we want to help. We want to uh, share God's grace and share God's bounty with, with those around us and those that we can. So if you know somebody that needs help, that, that needs uh, help, let us know. And we will do what we can as, as God provides. And we will be praying for you and for the others. And if you get the opportunity, share with somebody and help them be a blessing. And if you can't do it, then let the church know and, and we, will, we will step in and we will help also. God bless you. It's good to see you this morning. I see uh, friends and, and church family uh, coming online to be with this service and I just thank you. Uh, I just thank you that you're willing to set aside time and honor God in this way and I believe God will honor you also. 
Let's sing one more song before we hear God's message today. It's an oldie, <clears throat> Rock of Ages, and I, I just love this song, especially the second verse. But, uh, you join in. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. Now listen. Could my zeal tears forever flow? Could my zeal no longer know? These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hands no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown, and behold thee on thy throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in what a message that song has especially that second verse speaking to the grace of God and what he has done for us in salvation and how our trust is in him and in him alone if you have your bibles turn to first peter the book of first peter and i want to uh probably going to spend a week or two or maybe longer a month or two in the book of first and second peter and I think for a couple of reasons, I think because they speak to us today. I think because they speak to the situations that we're going through today, and they speak to the last days. And, and Peter is writing these two letters to people that are suffering persecution and going through the exact same things that you and I will go through and experience in the last days. And in fact, we're beginning to see that now. And so Peter is writing this letter to these people. It's a letter of encouragement. And he starts right off the bat with some just tremendous news and blessing, but also with some bad things. And um, I, I, I'm waffling on what to say because we're going to see it so much, especially in the book of Second Peter. There are a couple of things I just really want to say and point out. And folks, let me just do it like this. I know people don't like it sometimes when you call names or, or whatever, but, but the truth has got to be put out there by the word of God. Some of these guys that are on TV are not telling you the whole truth. And the book of Peter points that out above all things. First Peter and second Peter. And some of those guys on TV, and, and I listen to them because I need to know what they're doing, what they're saying, so I can warn you. And I do not encourage you to listen to them. They're only telling you part of the truth. And, and I've exemplified that in some of my past messages, showing you some of the things that the Bible says. And I could do that with this message today if I wanted to. I could give you all the good stuff and all the happy stuff and all the, the health and wealth stuff and stop. But I wouldn't be telling you the truth. Because Peter goes on and tells us the truth. And when I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, I gave my life to serve him. And when he called me to preach his word, he called me to preach his whole word. And folks, sometimes I don't like it any more than you do. There are times that I read things in the Bible and I say to myself, I wish that wasn't there, but it is. 
And when we go through life, especially the older we get and the more we understand about life and about the things of God, we see that the word of God is more and more and more true. I want to preach this morning just on the first and second verses of 1 Peter chapter 1, but then I'm going to tie in verses 3 through about 7 or 8 to what Peter is saying. And he begins like this. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I'll be reading from the NIV, the New International Version. He says, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Now, when I read this, there are things in that verse that I just love. First of all, Peter says, we are the elect of God, the people that he are writing to. He says, you are the elect of God, the chosen of God. You're special to God. You are the ones that God has put his hand on and that God is blessing and watching over. And he points that out when he says at the end of verse two, grace and peace be yours in abundance. And that word abundance, if you've got a good study Bible, you're going to have a footnote and it's going to say literally multiplied. Grace and peace multiplied to you. Wow, I like that. Peter is going to use words throughout his two letters, his writings here, like elect and chosen quite a bit. Those are going to be words that he tends to like and it goes back to his Jewish heritage. Remember, Peter was a staunch Jew. He was strong in his Jewish tradition and his Jewish upbringing. And remember that the Jews are God's chosen people. This goes all the way through the Bible, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God prophesies that promises that he is going to bring forth the seed of a woman. And then in Abraham, he makes the promise that that seed is going to come through Abraham, who is going to be the father of a great and a mighty nation. And we know that nation now to be the Jewish nation. Remember, Jesus said in John chapter 4, when he was speaking to the woman at the well, salvation comes from what? The Jews. That was the promise. They are God's chosen people. And Peter is steeped in that. And so those words to him are just natural. They're just common to him that he is part of God's chosen people, that the Jews are God's chosen people. And now in the New Testament, after the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Peter understands that that salvation, that chosenness or election goes forth to all people now. But remember this, Peter had some problems and remember that this also shows you how steeped Peter was in his Jewish tradition. In Acts chapter, I believe it was 10, when God was going to send Peter to preach to a Gentile man, he had to tell Peter three times to do it. You'll recall the, the story in Acts 10 where Peter was up on the roof praying and, and God had to give him a vision and let down a sheet with all types of, of animals, all types of food on that. And, and Peter said, Lord, I can't eat that. I, I, that's not clean. And God said, Peter, don't call unclean what I have called and made clean. Speaking of the Gentiles and Peter understood that after they came and told him that he was to go preach to the Gentiles. And he said, Lord, I see what you're saying. But the point being is that Peter had to be made to see that because of his Jewish tradition. And so when you read through here, you're going to see a lot of words and a lot of things that Peter says and does are examples that he uses that go back to his Jewish tradition. There's going to be one here in just a minute that we're going to read in particular where he uses a word that to most Baptists that, that are strong Baptists are going to say, how did he say that? Well, I'm going to show you how he said that and what it means in a few minutes, but just know that it is because of his 
strong Jewish background that he uses these words, but he understands that in the New Testament, under the new covenant that God has given in Jesus Christ, that you and I, the Gentiles, have now come to participate in and to be part of that chosen, to be part of that election of God. And then you're going to notice a couple of times that I'm going to preach on this, probably not next week, but the week after, that he tells us that God chose Christ before the foundation of the world to be the sacrificial lamb for the sin of all mankind. Now we know that from other writers. That's not just unique to Peter. John tells us, the, the apostle John tells us that Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Peter, uh, Paul gets on this pretty strong in Ephesians chapter one. All of the things that God did and provided for us before the foundation of the world, before the world was even created. And so Peter picks up on that also. But as we go through this text, one of the things that I want to ask or I want to point out to you because I think Peter brings this out so strong is how do we get to be the elect of God? When he says this to us, to God's elect, to God's chosen, as he says in verse two, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. How did we get to be God's elect? And Peter gives us three things here in verse two. That, that all happen, that all take part in our salvation. And this is how we become God's elect. Number one, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That's number one. We have become God's elect by the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, this speaks to God's omniscience and God's eternal nature and, and basically what that means is that God, he knows everything, but God sees the past, the present, and the future all in, in one. It's, it's all present to him because he is eternal. He is not bound by time like you and I are. He's not bound by the physical limitations of this world like you and I are. He sees it all. He sees the past. He sees the present. He sees the future as it is all is. And he sees that and it's going to happen the way that he planned it and the way that he sees it. God planned, the Bible has already told us before the world began, that salvation would be in his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. God predestined that. That word predestined typically goes along with the thought of foreknowledge or, or what we're talking about here. And God predestined that Jesus would be the way of salvation and forgiveness for mankind. That word predestined, one of its definitions means to limit out in advance. In other words, to set a boundary in advance. And the boundary that God has set in advance is that if you are going to be saved, if you are going to have your sins forgiven and be born again, it is going to be through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. There is no other way to come to God. There is no other way to find salvation except through Jesus Christ. That's what God predestined. That's what God put up. And he said, this is the limits. This is the way that it's going to be. And in God's foreknowledge, he gave us Jesus Christ because he knew that, that we as sinners could not pay for our sin. We could not be that sacrifice. We couldn't be perfect. And so in his foreknowledge, even before we were created, he provided in Jesus Christ that we might be saved and become the elect of God. How did we become the elect of God? When God called you by the conviction of the Holy Spirit, he has quickened your spirit. And what that means is he enabled you. He gave you the ability to believe him, to understand that you needed a savior and to repent and trust him. That's how you became the elect 
of Jesus Christ. So, as he says in the second one, he says, and through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So he says, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So, God the Father knew all of this, planned all of this, put limits. He predestined, set limits out. This is how it's going to be, what it is going to be. And he sent the Holy Spirit to come into men, to convict them, to draw them to what God has provided for salvation. Now, let me point this out real quick because people get hung up and, and go off in, in all kinds of directions, aka Oprah Winfrey. When the Holy Spirit draws you, he is going to draw you to Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. If the Holy Spirit leads you to anything else, it is not the Spirit of God. If the Holy Spirit that you are talking to, that you are following, tells you that you can be saved, that you can find approval with God, that you can find forgiveness for your sins in any other way but that of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, that is not the Holy Spirit of God. That's another spirit. The sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is that he comes to us. He convicts us that we are sinners. There's something wrong with our life. He draws us to Jesus Christ. And he shows us that on the cross, Jesus died for our sins. And through his resurrection, by his blood offered as the payment for our sins, that we can have forgiveness and eternal life and be right with God. Therefore, through Jesus Christ, Paul says, we have peace with God. We have been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Notice what Ephesians chapter 1 says. Let me get over there real quick. I want to read you just a couple of verses from Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. The apostle Paul is speaking to us, and he says this, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who were God's possession to the praise of his glory. Do you hear that? It's the Holy Spirit that comes upon you and that seals you and that draws you and convicts you and marks you out and makes you the elect of God. And then he says one more. He says this, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Now there's that word. For those of you that are staunch Baptists, that word's going to be a problem, and it was a problem for me. I had to do a little studying and a little little thinking about it. The word sprinkled. We don't sprinkle. The New Testament teaches baptism. You go all the way back to Jesus giving out the Great Commission, and Jesus didn't say, go and, and sprinkle everybody. Jesus said, go and baptize. And the Greek word that is used in the New Testament for baptism is baptizo, and it means to immerse. It doesn't mean to sprinkle. It means to immerse. So the correct mode of biblical New Testament water baptism is to immerse. So what is Peter talking about here when he says that we are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ? Go back to what I said in the beginning of this message. Peter is a staunch Jew. He knows and he understands Jewish tradition, and above all, he knows the Old Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, especially dealing with the temple, with the, the, the congregation of the people and the covenant of the law, the Bible says that all of those things were sprinkled by the blood. 
Now you can go back to Exodus chapter 24 and Leviticus chapter 18 and you can read it all up in there and study it all there or you can take the short version or we might call it the cliff note version and turn to Hebrews chapter 9 and begin in verse 16. He says, in the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it. Because the will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant, which was, put in, which was not put into effect without blood. And then he explains it. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet, wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, when I, when I read that in context of what we are talking about today and in the context of what the writer of Hebrews is telling us, I have to think about a couple of things. When I think about the Old Testament and Moses standing before the temple and the congregation of Israel gathered out before him, can you imagine how much blood it would have taken to <laughs> baptize all of them? Can you imagine how much blood it would have taken just to baptize the, 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 tab the temple, the tabernacle that they had there and the utilities, utility, the utensils and the, the offerings, the altars and all of those things. And so I think what God did is in provision for that, he used sprinkling. And we're going to see in just a minute in, in verse 11 uh, a couple of other things in the way he relates it to Jesus Christ and his blood. But the sprinkling of that blood was symbolic of them coming into the blood of that covenant. The blood of that covenant was not the final offering for sin, but it was pointing them and looking forward to the offering that Jesus Christ made for their sin. That's why they had to come do it. Every year, the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies once a year, every year, and offer blood for the sins of the people because it was not final. It was only partial, looking forward to the day that Jesus Christ would come. Now he says in verse 11, still in Hebrews chapter 9, he says, but when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater, more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and of calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. Now watch this, thus obtaining eternal redemption. When Jesus offered himself on the cross and when he offered his blood on the mercy seat in the temple in heaven, it was the final payment for our sin. There is no more. There is no more offering of blood or of anything else. It was done once and Jesus secured for us, he says, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Verse 13, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. That's all that that did for the time. When Moses sprinkled them, they were outwardly clean so that they could come to the to temple, to the ceremony, and worship God, but it did nothing for them on the inside. That's why they had to keep coming. That's why they had to keep offering, because the blood of bulls and goats could not change them on the inside. It could only cleanse them ceremonially 
so they could worship God. Verse 14, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences, the inside, from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. Do you see the difference? The blood of bulls and goats sprinkled was a passing thing. It was only a thing to get to Jesus Christ, the final payment for our sins. When Jesus Christ offered his blood for our sins, it was accepted as the one-time payment for eternal redemption. And when we come to Jesus Christ, not only does he cleanse us and make us ceremonially clean, but he baptizes us into his blood, into his body, into his forgiveness, therefore cleansing us on the inside. That's why the Bible says you must be born again. That's why Nicodemus had so much problem with that. That's why he couldn't understand what Jesus was telling him because he kept wanting to relate it back to the physical, back to the law, back to the Jewish tradition. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you've got to understand that you must be born from above, born from on high, born of the Spirit. And that's what chapter 3 verse 8 is about in John. John chapter 3 and verse 8, the wind blows where it will. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And notice that he says the wind blows where it will and you can't see where it comes from or where it's going, but you can see the effects. That's the difference in the blood of Jesus and the blood of goats and bulls. The blood of goats and bulls can only sprinkle and can only touch the outside ceremonially. But the blood of Jesus touches the inside and makes us clean. Oh, you've got to trust in Jesus. You've got to come to Christ. Because Peter tells us that if we are going to be the chosen of God, if we are going to be the elect of God, we have got to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Without the blood of Jesus, there is no salvation. Without the blood of Jesus, there is no redemption and no hope for mankind. And then what he says, he says that we are to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Again, he points to the change there. Once you come to Christ, once you are saved, once you are born again, there is change. And I want to point out to you that without the foreknowledge of God, the work of God in your life, without the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, and without the blood of Jesus Christ, you cannot be obedient to Jesus. All of our righteous acts, the Bible says in Isaiah, are as filthy rags. But when we come to Christ, when we accept him as our Lord and Savior, we then become the righteousness of God in him and we change. And now what we do is we are obedient to Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit that indwells us and gives us the ability, the righteousness to serve God. And he tells us then, after that, after we, we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to the, be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood, then he says, grace and peace be yours in abundance. Ooh, that's the good part. I like that. And remember, I told you that word in abundance, it literally means be multiplied to you. Grace and peace be yours multiplied to you. And part of that grace and peace, part of those things that we have in abundance in Christ is beginning in verse three. And he says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept for you in heaven. Amen. Verse five, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, after reading those things, we can all say amen. 
I like being the elect of God. I like being chosen because, man, I've got an inheritance. I've got riches in Christ Jesus that will never fail. They will never fade. They will never spoil. They're kept for me in heaven. All of that, that I am a joint heir with Christ to the eternal blessings of heaven. And then he says, I am shielded by faith, by God's power, not mine by God's power. See, that's one of the fallacies of Kenneth Copeland and Jesse Duplantis and those guys, those faith guys. It's your faith, your faith, your faith. Hey, uh -uh. I'm not trusting in my faith. I'm trusting in the faith of Jesus Christ that was given to me, that was quickened in me when the Holy Spirit called me and came to me. It's not my faith. It's his faith. Peter said when they raised the man that was crippled there at the uh, uh, gate in, in Acts chapter three, remember what Peter said? He said, it, it's not anything that we did. He said, it's by the name of and the faith of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Go on, Kenneth. Get rich on your lies. Trust in Jesus. It's the faith of Jesus Christ that he puts in us. And it is that faith, by that faith, that we are shielded by the power of God until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That's multiplication. Now that's some math that I can deal with. That's what it means to be the elect of God, to have God's grace, God's blessing upon you. But then the question comes up, and this is exactly why Peter wrote these two letters, and this is exactly what I was talking about earlier. If, if I am God's elect, if I am chosen by God through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and the blood of Jesus Christ, why the heck am I suffering? like an exile in this world. And that's exactly what Peter asks us. Notice what he says in verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered. And notice, if you would, verse 6. He says, in all this you greatly rejoice. Well, all of this is what we were getting excited about just a while ago, the, the power of God shielding us and, and the grace of God and the mercy of God. And he says, in all of this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. So if I am God's elect, why am I having to go through all of this? Why all of this suffering? Why all of this being treated like an exile? Well, before I answer that question, biblically, let me make something very, very, very clear. What Peter is talking about with suffering is not standing in a long line at Walmart because they've only got three cashier lines open. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about suffering as in having allergies every year. My allergies are tearing me up right now, and, and it's a, a twice yearly thing that I go through, and I suffer with them. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about suffering in, even in the thoughts of how we grow old and, and our bodies begin to break down and arthritis and sickness and disease, that's not what Peter's talking about. And Peter makes it clear, and we're going to see this as we go through the books, what he's talking about is suffering for the name of Jesus Christ. The other word for that is persecution. That's what he's talking about. He says they are exiles. They are God's elect, but they are exiles. And then he says again in verse 6, he says, Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. So if I'm the elect of God, why am I suffering like an exile? Well, two reasons we suffer. 
Number one, because I am an exile. Put simply in words that we can understand the things we're familiar with, this world is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim passing through. Because I am born again, because I am the elect of God, chosen by the foreknowledge of God and by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ to be obedient to Jesus Christ, I now live among people that do not understand my values. They do not understand my way of life or the hope that we live in of eternity. They don't understand that. They don't understand why we do what we do. And the reason they don't understand it is because we are not citizens of this world. Since we have been born again, we have been infused with the Holy Spirit of God. We have now become new creatures in Christ. The old has passed away and the new has come. Our values have changed. Where the world is, as some of the old commercials used to tell us, you only go around once, so get all you can. Well, folks, that's not what we live by as children of God, because we know that we're not only going around once. We know that this life is only a moment in, and we're going to see that in just a minute, is only a moment in our existence and that eternity is what we look for. Listen to what Peter says. Turn over to Second Peter. I, I want to kind of tie this in. And Second Peter chapter 3, and listen to what Peter says about this world that we live in. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 11, he says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Well, what is he talking about? Verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. So if you bought into that lie that you only go around once and get all you can now, all you can get now is eventually going to be destroyed, but it's going to be gone. And so Peter says, since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Well, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. The day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Verse 14, so then, dear friends, since you were looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace in him. Now you've, now you kind of got to categorize yourself. What are you looking for? Where is your hope? Because if your hope, if your existence is wrapped up in the things of this world, then folks, that's all you're going to get. And it's going to be destroyed. But if your hope is laid up in heaven, if your hope is on Jesus Christ and his promises, then the people of this world don't understand you because you're not bound by what you can get and what you can accomplish and who you are in this world. Matter of fact, your identity, if you would, is wrapped up in Jesus Christ and who you will be in that world. That's why we suffer in this world. That's why people look at us and, and think we're weird and, and people don't invite us to do things and, and people don't necessarily want to be around us because we are different. And we will suffer persecution in this world. 
But listen to what Paul says. Paul calls it a momentary light trouble. He says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs all of our troubles in this life. So even if we suffer for, let's say, the whole length of our life, the, let's just start now for the rest of our life. I don't know how long I'm going to live, be it six months or another 20 years, I don't know. But let's just say that, that however long I live for the rest of my life, I suffer persecution. Maybe like Paul and them did. Maybe I get arrested for something I've preached or for being a Christian. Or maybe the government turns on us Christians, which they're going to eventually. And they start taking away our homes and taking away our livelihoods. And we have to live like, like bums. We have to live out in the street and just scavenging for what we can get because the world turns on us. If, if I have to live like that the rest of my natural life, that is only a momentary light affliction compared to the glory that will be revealed in me. You see why we don't live for the things of this world, but we live for Jesus Christ and for the eternal glory that will be revealed in us. It will all be worth it all then. And if you are focused. If your mind is set on the right thing, it'll be worth it now. Let me share one more passage with you, and then I'll bring my last point. Colossians chapter 3. Paul says this, beginning in verse 1 of Colossians chapter 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Are you a Christian? Are you born again? Then you've been raised with Christ. Since then, that you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. If I'm God's elect, why am I suffering in this world? That's the reason, because I am God's elect. I'm an exile. I'm a stranger to this world. And number two, why am I suffering in this world? And you're not going to like this one, but it's the biblical truth. And I can't do anything but tell you what the Bible says. The reason that you are suffering in this world is to help you grow and mature in your faith. Oh, preacher, we... we that's what God says, okay? God says that without those things in our lives, we will not grow in our faith. Turn to James chapter one. I know this is a lot of y'all's favorite verse in the Bible. That was meant as a joke. James chapter one, beginning in verse two, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Why? If I'm God's elect, if I'm chosen by God, am I suffering in this world? I am suffering for two reasons, so that I may mature, grow up in my faith, and so that my faith may be shown to be genuine. Let me ask you a quick question. How many people do you know that are Christians? Now qualify that. How many people do you know that claim to be Christians? And how many people do you know that when they suffer, they are still Christians when they come out the other side. You see the difference? The things that we suffer prove the genuineness of our faith. A lot of people say they're Christians. 
a lot of people can quote you various verses of scripture and say, this is what God has for you and this is what God wants for you. But when the rubber hits the road, that's when you see what your faith is really made of. I've been around people all my life that as long as everything is going good, as long as everything's are going the way they think they should, they're happy. But the first thing that happens is why would God let this happen to me? The first time something goes wrong that they didn't think should have, I don't understand why God is letting this happen. If God is a God of love, you hear that? If God is a God of love, if God is all powerful, how can he let this happen? Well, I'll tell you how he can let it happen. He can let it happen to show you what kind of faith you've got. Is your faith genuine or is your faith your faith? And it's based on what you want and what you think rather than what God says. Let me give you an example and then I'll close. Job. Everything Job went through. And I know that he got to some points where he got depressed. And he, at one point, he even said, cursed be the day that I was born. But the Bible clearly and plainly says that in everything Job went through, he never once cursed God and he never once charged God with wrongdoing. Can you say that? Let me share one more scripture. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. Peter says this, For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. Verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his footsteps. Now, Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his footsteps and Here's the example, verse 22. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. And when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Now, somebody might be thinking right now, preacher, you sure have calmed down. You're not as excited as you were earlier in the message. And that's because of what I told you earlier in the message. There are parts of the Bible that I don't like either. That's just the way it is. I don't like that verse right there that says, but unto this you have been called that you might suffer. For the name of Christ. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. And I don't want to suffer. But I am an exile. In this world. And the Bible tells us. That we are different. Than everybody else in this world. Because we are God's children. And the things that we suffer in this world can't even, Paul says, begin to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us at his return. Now, my last word. We're going to look at prophecy, and that's what we're looking at, especially on Wednesday night, is prophecy in Isaiah. And every prophecy that God made has been fulfilled, every one of them. And that means that the prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled, such as what we're talking about here, the, the heaven, the glory in heaven, that means that all of those prophecies will be fulfilled just like God said they would. 
And I'm going to show you prophecy and history that's been fulfilled. The greatest uh, evidence of God's word being completely true and trustworthy is the Jewish nation. How can you not look at the Jewish nation and not see God's hand? What I'm telling you is this. If you will trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, not your faith, not that junk that they teach you on TV, but if you will trust Jesus Christ, and if you will say, Lord, save me, he will. And he will change you on the inside and you will become a new person. But you will also, as that new person, suffer persecution in this world. If not now, it will come. But with that persecution will come the strength to endure because we are, remember what he said, shielded by God's power. We are sealed, Ephesians 5 said, by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, oh, if you will trust Jesus Christ, that is yours. That is yours. And that's the hope of his salvation and it will come to pass. God bless you. If you don't know Jesus, folks, I don't know any other way to put it. You are lost. You are a pagan outside of God's will and you will die in your sin and go to hell. But God, as we already saw, has predetermined. Listen, he has predestinated that if you will call upon Jesus Christ in faith that he will save you. That's predestination. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10, 9, go look it up. That's predestination. Will you call upon Jesus today? Will you trust him today? Oh, Lord Jesus, we have read your word today, Father. And part of it we don't like. But Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would teach us and prepare us for the days that lie ahead of us, for the things that your word tells us is coming. And Father, that when those things begin to happen, that we would stand strong, knowing that we are shielded by your power and knowing that these things will only show that our faith is genuine because it's placed in you and in your word. Father, give us that by the sanctifying work of your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be obedient to Jesus Christ. Father, I pray if there's one this morning that has never trusted you, that you would draw them to Jesus and, Father, give them the ability to trust him. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. If you want to accept Jesus Christ, give me a call. Email me, text me. I'll call you and, and I'll share again the word of God and show you how simple it is. But know that hard times are coming. But you can be saved. You can trust Jesus today. If you have prayer request. If you have a need that we can help you with, please let us know. Get word to me and we will get back to you and we will, by God's grace, meet that need. God loves you. God's face will shine upon you if you will trust him. In Jesus' name, amen.